she had, unfortunately, a, a devastating recurrence. Unfortunately, she lost her limb. But she was able to recover, and she was able to ski and walk, and she came and sang the national anthem for us, and almost everybody in the crowd had a tear in the eye. This is the James Cancer-Free World Podcast. I'm Steve Wartenberg, and my guest today is Joel Marison, director of the James Sarcoma Program and one of the world's leading sarcoma surgeons. In a previous episode, episode 48, Joel filled us in on some of the amazing surgical advances for patients with bone sarcomas, and we met one of his patients, Jared Sylvester, who talked about his own remarkable cancer journey and recovery. So if you haven't downloaded episode 48, give it a listen when you get a chance. Today, Joel will first update us on a few more advances in sarcoma treatment, and then we'll talk about an important and very inspiring James fundraising event, the 12th annual Steps for Sarcoma. It will be held on September 26th, and it will be virtual again this year, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, which means there's still time for you to sign up and participate and support this wonderful, important event. The website, which we'll repeat later, and Joel will tell us a lot more about it, is stepsforsarcomaevent.com, all one word, Steps for sarcomaevent.com. So Joel, um, fill us in. What, since we talked last, what's one or two advances you and your team at the James have have done? Sure. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for uh, having me on today. Um, one of the things we're doing now is um, when patients come in to um, see us that have a diagnosed sarcoma, we actually often have their pathology re-reviewed uh, by our pathologist to make sure they have a correct diagnosis. In addition, we often send it out for molecular analysis. Uh, those molecular changes can't really be seen by the pathologists and have to be um, determined by specific genetic testing. That gives us an area, if there's a gene fusion product that the genetics show in this tumor, we now can use sometimes different chemotherapy trials or different chemotherapeutic agents that are targeted towards that gene fusion product so we can tailor their medical treatment and medical management and improve their overall care. I, I just recently learned about this concept of gene fusions, fusion. Someone in Samik Rachatari's lab explained it to me. And it's, and tell me if I get this right, and if this is what you mean, that when your cells replicate thousands and millions of times in 20,000 different uh, combinations, two things that shouldn't fuse next to each other do, and that can cause a problem. Correct. And so when you see that in one of your patients, what does that mean? Those become a marker uh, or a target for a specific drug that is a pathway um, in, the, in the cell cycle so that they can then, the, the chemotherapy agent can work as a target against that cancer cell uh, and hopefully help destroy the cancer cell. Wow. So that's another tool you have to, to fight this. Absolutely. Um, and we're learning about lots of different new genetic changes in sarcoma that we never knew before with this type of testing. And it just broadens the treatment options for patients um, depending on the, where they're at in their disease process and what type of sarcoma they have. So in your case, since you do surgery in often cases, this treatment for the gene fusion and for the other genetic mutations, that's something you do first to stabilize or reduce the tumor, and then you would do your surgery? Exactly. Exactly. So hopefully if it responds well, it will shrink the tumor and the patient will need a smaller surgery and allow them to have better function and, and less things removed when we take out their cancer. Okay. So there's a great step forward in sort of pre-surgery. And is there something surgically involved that that's new since we last talked? Absolutely. We're, we've now started a project in combination with our veterinary colleagues. Uh, one of the veterinary surgical oncologists uh, used a machine called an optical coherence tomography or OCT that is essentially like an ultrasound machine, but it uses light. Um, once we take the tumor out while the patient is still on the operating table, uh, she can analyze the margin or the area where we think the tumor margin is closest and tell us while the patient is still asleep 
if we need to take more tissue. We're hoping that as we refine these techniques that it will allow us to take less tissue uh, so we can leave patients more functional. And also if something happens to be closer than what we thought it would be, that we could still take more tissue while the patient's asleep during that surgery and they wouldn't have to need a second surgery to go back and get more tissue. Wow, that's fascinating. And since this was someone at the, the College of Veteran, Veterinary Medicine, does that mean they first started doing this on uh, perhaps dogs over there? They did. They started doing this in dogs and cats. Uh, and she is part of our multidisciplinary sarcoma program. Uh, she came to us and um, applied for a grant through Steps for Sarcoma uh, that we had raised through our philanthropic uh, arm of the sarcoma program. Uh, she was able to get a grant, uh, and that grant is funding this pilot study of the first 20 patients. Uh, we've completed 11, uh, and as we collate that data, we're hopefully going to take that pilot grant and then be able to apply to larger national organizations such as the, the Sarcoma Foundation of America um, and, and, and getting larger grant uh, of a couple hundred thousand dollars um, and then to take this broader that our goal is to bring this to clinical care in humans uh, and improve surgical care. Is the James the first cancer hospital doing this? Uh, people have used this off and on um, for care, but this is the first trial that I'm aware of that's tried to use it in real time uh, in humans. So when you say real time, I'm trying to imagine your surgery. You're doing a surgery. You've identified the tumor or tumors you have to remove, you want to get all the tumor out and leave a small margin of, you don't want to take out too much good tissue. And this will help, this will allow you to, I'm guessing, reduce the amount of good tissue you take out because then you can recheck and go back in if you haven't, if you've missed something. Correct. And so we like to get somewhere around a centimeter of good tissue around the tumor to get adequate margins. And this will give us an idea if, if we've taken enough, because our goal in sarcoma surgery is to never actually see the tumor itself because they're small microscopic cells that live in the reactive zone right around the tumor. We wanna make sure those get removed so they don't increase the chance that the patient can have recurrence. And the less you, and because yours are very, inv they're in the bones, they're in the shoulder. So you wanna be the least invasive you can so people have the best quality of life. And this sounds like this has given you ways to get there. Exactly. And so our, our goal hopefully is to take the right amount of tissue to remove the cancer, but to leave as much as we can yeah. to leave the patient as functional as they can be. And, and just, I want to make something, I think you'll correct me if I'm wrong, is, is these uh, tests with cats and dogs at the veterinary college, these are to treat and help cure the animals. This is not some sort of just test on the, on the general process. This is actually to help these animals. Absolutely. Dogs and cats get soft tissue and bone sarcomas more frequently than what a lot of people realize. And so this is not research in the cats and dogs. These animals actually are coming to our veterinary surgeons with cancer and they're using this device to help treat their cancer. Yeah, because you see a lot of dogs that are missing one leg, and that's their sarcoma, right? A absolutely, most of the time. Yeah, the, actually, Ohio State's veterinary school is the preclinical testing site for osteosarcoma for the United States for new drug therapy. And so this is one of the new surgical therapies that the vet school was using uh, in combination with that program. Okay, that's an excellent way to co connect uh, the research with the steps for sarcoma. So we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, um, Joel will tell us more about steps for sarcoma. A revolution in lung cancer treatment is happening at the James. We're proving lung cancer isn't solely defined by location and stage, but rather the individual molecules and genes that drive it. Simply put, there is no routine lung cancer. That's why our world-renowned specialists put their expertise towards treating one particular lung cancer, yours. At The James, we go beyond the routine to prevent, detect, treat, and cure your lung cancer. To learn more, call 1-800-293-5066. We're back with Joel Marison, director of the James Sarcoma Program. And Joel, let's talk a little bit about Steps for Sarcoma. It's in its 12th year. And 
I've sort of noticed we're recording this the week before Pelotonia, which you also participate in every year. And the James has a lot of these events that bring families and their caregivers together with the James community. Why is it important to have these events where we're, we're together and doing something together? I think it really builds a community uh, of family and clinicians and getting together and to be able to celebrate the advances that we have uh, in cancer treatment and allows us to understand what's happening as a community and then to know that we're raising funds to, to build that next step in cancer treatment or that next step in cancer education or that next step in providing patients the ability to be able to receive their cancer care by increasing the social awareness of getting early diagnosis uh, or um, being able to come to facilities by understanding what resources are available to them um, uh, on, a, on a regular basis to get their cancer care. Now, it's going to be virtual this year and was virtual last year because of the uh, pandemic and because, I mean, cancer patients, we, you have to be extra careful with. But sort of describe, sort of set the scene for the last one where people actually walk. Where is it and, and what's it like? And, and for you, what's it like to walk with some of your patients? So um, each year we have our uh, event uh, at uh, Chemical Abstracts. Uh, they're wonderful uh, sponsors for us. Um, and uh, we usually will uh, start the day with giving everybody some time to gather. There are games for everyone. Uh, we have had about 1,500 participants uh, for the past several years. Uh, we usually try to get all of the survivors together uh, and to get a survivor picture. Um, and then we will have uh, our walk. Uh, we'll get everybody through. We have um, in sarcoma, we have patients of all ages and all abilities. Uh, and once they're done with their walk, then we will have some more time to celebrate with one another. Uh, we usually have a 50-50 raffle uh, that uh, almost every year the, the winner will donate back to the event. Uh, and then we have a, a silent auction uh, and a raffle uh, that helps raise money for the event as well. Uh, it normally takes about three hours and um, uh, patients enjoy it immensely. They get to meet people uh, that have gone through the same process that they've gone through. Uh, they get to spend time with their uh, nurses and their doctors outside of the hospital and outside of clinical care. And it's really a fantastic time for all of us. Um, you know, for me as a physician, I get to see my patients. I get to see my colleagues' patients. We get to walk with one another and really celebrate life. Um, you know, cancer really can challenge our, our quality of life uh, and this is just a reaffirmation that people can get out there and lead a normal life after their cancer care, spend time with their family, their friends, and their caregivers, and, and really just enjoy a really high quality of life for a good cause to raise money for the people that are coming behind them um, and to get advances in the next steps of treatment. And from what you've taught me about sarcomas, the majority are in the extremities, the legs and the arms. So that means there's a lot of people who've had uh, long steel rods inserted or new elbows and shoulders and knees and even some amputations. So these are people who walking must be a real life affirming um, day. A absolutely. You know, one of the biggest things that people come to see us uh, when they first start is uh, the questions they ask are, am I going to lose my arm or am I going to lose my leg through their cancer treatment? And thankfully, most of the time we can save their arm or their leg and we can leave them very functional, maybe not exactly the way they were, but very, very functional that allows them to do almost everything. And so that, and that's, that's fantastic for us as, as caregivers that we can see them out in real life walking um, and, and doing the things that they want to do because of the care we were able to provide for them. Is there any particular patient or patients that you've walked with that just really has a strong memory for you? Oh, absolutely. Um, the, the, uh, their, uh, one patient uh, was, a, um, was an E9 in the Marine Corps, which is the highest enlisted rank in the Marine Corps uh, many years ago when we started. Um, and he really had um, a tough time walking, but made it through just out of perseverance, it was a fantastic time. Um, we had another young woman that um, we did a, a really um, 
big limb salvage operation on that allowed her to walk. And she had, unfortunately, a, a devastating recurrence. And unfortunately, she lost her limb. But she was able to recover and she was able to ski and walk. And she came and sang the national anthem for us. And almost everybody in the crowd had a tear in the eye. It was pretty fantastic. And then she walked with one leg uh, uh, around most of the course as well. So um, she was able to, to use crutches and walk. Um, and it just really was a great day seeing her do that. Wow. So for you, that must, they inspire you to, to do more. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. How much has, has it raised over the years? Uh, we've in the first 11 years, we've raised, um, about one little over $1.2 million. Uh, and it's gradually increased every year. Uh, we started out our first year, uh, with about 200 people and we raised about $7,000. Uh, and now we have usually about 1,500 people and raise somewhere between um, 90 and 125 thousand dollars a year, um, and uh, it keeps growing uh, each year as we get more and more participants. Now you gave us a great example of how some of the money was used with the um, the College of Veterinary Medicine to develop this new scanning technique that'll help you. Uh, with margins when you do surgery. What's another example or two of the grants or the research you've, you've done with the money? So um, one of the grants has gone to uh, help us create a database for our sarcoma patients so that we can find out um, when patients have treatment for the same problem and the same type of tumor, uh, that we can see how longitudinally those treatments affect them and when they're effective, are these the right things to continue doing for them? Because some of these tumors are so rare that we really um, are starting from a, a disadvantage of not having a great treatment option. And this will help us as we move forward to continue to learn that and setting up that for our program. Uh, we have uh, another study that's working on patients that present with advanced disease and finding the molecular characteristics of those advanced disease so that we can hopefully use some of the newer targeted chemotherapy agents that I talked about uh, to uh, stabilize their tumor and prolong their life. Um, and so we try to give out uh, three awards each year, one for basic science research, uh, one for clinical research, and one for uh, translational research. And each one of those brings a different aspect to our program. Um, they're usually between twenty-five dollars and $30,000 per year for each of them. So it depends on how much money we raise. So uh, for all of you out there, the more you're able to support us, the more money we can give to the young researchers to provide uh, uh, more seed money for them. And these seed grants of twenty-five dollars to $30,000 are used to get pilot data. That's really difficult to find that money. Uh, and then we use it to, uh, they use it to try to find bigger grants from national organizations. Yeah. One of the things I've learned from you and others is that funding young researchers to get them the, that initial funding is really difficult. And they're so often the ones who are coming up with these great ideas because they're young and have new ideas and look at things in different ways. Absolutely. We need, that's how we support our young scientists and our young researchers. Uh, and, and without uh, credentials behind you that you've done a lot of things, it is hard to gain that first small amount of money uh, to be able to take your idea the next step. And that's really what Steps for Sarcoma has done is it allows them to take those ideas on a pilot basis, get the data to be able to apply to bigger organizations and say, yes, my idea does work on a preliminary basis. I think there's a good chance that it's going to help a lot of people and um, your money uh, that you give us is going to be well spent um, in uh, furthering supporting this research. Again, that example you gave from the veterinary uh, college is, is exactly that. You just you had said that the data you're accumulating now, you hope to get a, a much bigger grant. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and, and it's almost tenfold. The, the grants that um, start out at twenty five or thirty thousand dollars end up being one hundred and fifty to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars initially. And then those grants, when uh, they are successful, end up leading to grants from the National Cancer Institute or National Institute of Health that are over a million dollars. Um, and so we have a couple people that are on the precipice of getting a couple of those larger grants from Steps for Sarcoma money as well. Wow, that's great. And you'll have to let me know about that. And maybe I'll do a podcast with some of those people. 
<laughs> Sounds great. So just fill people in on, since it's virtual this year, uh, again, the website is stepsforsarcomaevent.com. But how will it work this year virtually? How can they get involved? What can they do? And I know there's ways to sort of virtually walk or participate. Absolutely. So you can, once you go to the website, stepsforsarcomaevent.com, you can sign up. Uh, you can um, develop a group that you can uh, go together. Um, you can do whatever activity you want. You can create your own walk uh, virtually. There is a, a silent auction. Uh, there are lots of items that you can uh, uh, bid on and uh, hopefully win. For those Buckeye fans out there, there's some signed items that are hard to get at other places. Uh, and really, we're trying to make it a community um, and uh, have people have fun while they're doing it. Um, and then uh, next year, uh, hopefully, we'll be able to come back better than ever in a, in a live fashion. And uh, this will provide the continued support we need for those uh, research studies. Okay. Well, Joel, thank you for filling us in for all the great work you do for your support for um, Steps for Sarcoma. And good luck this year and, and next year. I think I'm going to get involved and come to come walk with you next year. That sounds wonderful, Steve. Thanks for having us. This podcast is brought to you by the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center, Arthur G. James Cancer Hospital, and Richard J. Solov Research Institute. For more information, check out our website, cancer.osu.edu.